Okay, any questions before we begin? <coughs> now, if you have any questions about electrostatics or the circuits, you should ask now because uh, today we will be starting a new subject. Okay. Other question? Well, let's discuss that one. We <coughs> temperature. The resistance versus the temperature. Now, what causes resistance? Why does a material have a resistance? <coughs> Other comments? What causes resistance? There is this one. That they <coughs> I mean, we usually say them impurities in the sense that if you take some carbon, and a, a copper wire, it will have atoms that are not carbon, that that are not copper. So they will have a, a different relation with their electrons than the carbon, the, than the copper does. So as the electrons are moving, when they hit these uh, other uh, atoms they will lose some of their energy. No, we are not yet discussing the temperature. I mean, what causes resistance itself? Okay, that is another uh, explanation, at least the difference between an insulator and the conductor. Now, insulators can be thought of as materials having infinite resistance. They don't let any current to run through. But what, what about the difference between, let's say, copper and carbon? They are both conductors, and they have different resistances. Now, you see, when a material has a resistance, what happens is, Due to some mechanism, one of them is these impurities. There are different at different kinds of atoms in in a material that, as the electrons are moving, they will hit these impurities. It is a different met different uh, atoms. Another thing is, if you take a carbon, it's not it's not. If you take copper, it's not really so regular. I mean, just imagine it like, and if you go in a Artificial forest, for example, an analogy would be in an artificial forest, all the trees are in a row. So if you, you can really run fast in this forest, it's, you just follow the, you just go in between the uh, trees and you can really travel very fast without losing energy. But if you are in a natural forest, the trees are distributed randomly. So if you are, as you are moving in one direction, Inevitably, you will hit a tree, so you have to change your direction frequently. You will be hitting the trees, and you will be losing your energy. So these two mechanisms are just examples of mechanisms through which the electrons, as they are accelerating through your uh, conductor, they will lose their energy. Now, that is basically what we call the resistance. Resistance is something that causes the electrons to lose their energy. Now, let's imagine the, what the temperature does. Now, you see, temperature, we didn't discuss it in too much detail, but it's always said that it is the average kinetic energy of the atoms or molecules making the system. So if the, at higher temperatures, each of one of these atoms, they are, moving, they are just oscillating back and forth in the, around their equilibrium point. So if they're oscillating very fast around their equilibrium point, so as an electron goes by, it is there is a higher probability that it will be colliding with this atom. So the probability of these collisions, it will be increasing. But these collisions, they create energy loss. They cause energy loss. So the resistance, at a higher temperature, the atoms will be vibrating uh, more violently, so they will be colliding with the electrons more often. Since they are colliding with the electrons more often, they will be causing electrons to lose more energy which means they will, the resistance, resistivity, will have a temperature dependence. <laughs> the 
Now, what happens when the resistance increases? The current will drop. The current will drop. Well, the current, if you remember, it depends on two things. The density of carriers, well, the temperature will not affect it that much, times the drift velocity. As you said, the drift velocity will decrease. That's the increasing of the resistance. So the resistivity will have some temperature de dependence. And well, since it's a function of temperature, we can just make an expansion. It will have, it should have such a form, some rho zero, some let's say some cons coefficient times t minus t zero, plus some other constant t minus t zero squared over two, plus etc. So it has some temperature dependence. Well, usually we just ignore these terms; they are small. And this term, rho of t, you can approximate the temperature dependence through such an expression. Now, this is nice because this, I mean, in mechanics, it, it, towards the end of 109, we discussed what temperature is. So, and there we were mainly using the ideal gas to measure the temperature to make a thermometer. Well, this is another way that you can measure the temperature. You can use this in, let's say, just Picking up a voltmeter, in fact, you can make a temperature scale, a thermometer. Well, how will you do that? You, you just apply some, let's say, some potential difference across a resistance, across a resistor, measure its resistance. So from the measured value of the resistance, you can determine uh, what rho is. So if you know the temperature, the if you know this alpha, well, it will be calibrated or somebody can measure it. Once you know alpha, once you measure the resistance of your resistor by using a voltmeter and a power supply, you can determine what the temperature should be. So this is one of the principles how a digital thermometer can work. It just measures the resistance of a material. The, we already know that it depends on temperature. Measuring the exact value of the resistance will tell us what the temperature should be. This is the resistivity. If you remember, the resistance is rho times L over A. It depends on many parameters. One of them is how the atoms are organized. they have a tendency of having a lower resistance. Other questions? Now, why should they de depend on the potential energy? Okay. Well, that is what we call the electrical breakdown. <coughs> I mean, you're, you're, I mean, uh, you are probably saying that if you take any material with an insulator, let's say. We usually model the insulators as material resistors having infinite resistivity. But if you apply a sufficiently strong potential difference, eventually the material will break down. In it, it will go through an electrical breakdown in the sense that you will be applying such a huge electric field to the material. I mean, what's an insulator? In an insulator, the electrons are firmly attached to their uh, nucleus, all of the electrons. So if you apply a sufficiently strong electric field, you will be able to rip some of these electrons. And when you rip the electrons, it will 
there are free electrons and the electrons will start to move uh, uh, along the insulator. So that's what we mean by electrical breakdown. So eventually you break down the electrical uh, insulator, but that in that case you are mainly changing the material, definitely. So when we are talking about resistors, we usually talk about uh, things, objects, that retain their identity. So a resist, um, if you apply a very large, for example, an air atmosphere is an insulator if it's humid. But we know that there is a uh, the lightning. It's a flow of charge. It's not that the atmosphere in ordinary temperature becomes conductor. The atmosphere becomes something else, which has a lower conductivity, which has a high lower resist resistance. So we, c we cannot really say that in that case the resistance of the atmosphere has dropped. The, r the air has been modified. No, no. Not all the resistors have followed Ohm's law. For example, diodes, the LEDs, LED emitting diodes, they do not follow Ohm's law. They have a very small resistance if you flow current in one direction. They have a huge resistance if you try to make uh, the current flow in the opposite direction. Not all materials follow the Ohm's law. Try it. Not in the lab. <laughs> Other questions? Can you speak a bit louder? Well, you're asking this one. Suppose you are applying such a potential. Well, you have the resistance. and then you just touch one point. Nothing. And it will be as if this doesn't exist. Because you see, what the battery does, it gives charge and takes charge. It does both of it. So for example, uh, this the negative side of the battery will take some electron. Now give, give away an electron, sorry it will give out an electron, whereas the positive side will take an electron. So this electron, well, effectively, you can just imagine that it just follows this circuit. Now, this is, of course, true if, <coughs> I mean, in reality, what happens is if you have such uh, a circuit, usually it will be grounded someplace. So if you are over here, and hold it, well, you're a conductor. Ground is a conductor. So this is mainly this one. This is equivalent to this circuit. This one is U. So there are two circuits over here. Now, in this case, there will be an electric, f electric current running through your body. And if that electric current is huge, uh, it will be harmful. Yes, you will be just behave like a wire that has a somewhat a large resistance, nevertheless a finite one. And if there is a large current passing through your body, then it will stop your heart, stop your breathing, etc. Well, in that case, nothing really. No. Everything will be grounded. Everything is grounded eventually. Uh, also, there is the atmosphere. I mean, you see, you have to conserve electric charge. 
And the battery, it, if it gives away one charge, it takes also one charge. So, I mean, the, the current will just go around this one, unless there's some other circuit to close. I mean, without, without this grounding thing, I mean, you, your presence over here that will not really have much influence because you are not closing a circuit. But so, sooner or later, all the circuits there, they close over your body also, either due to the humidity in the air or since they are grounded. For example, if you, if you wear shoes that are good insulators, nothing will happen to you. Well, it divides into two. Here. Well, just, just this is the same as this one. What happens over here? You just two currents combine. Then this circuit doesn't exist. This circuit is open. If you don't touch it over here, this circuit is open. And the yes. No. Here, there's no charge flow. Other questions? Okay, so let's start with magnetism. Where is magnesia? It's Manisa. In Turkish, so, well, this is the origin of magnets. <coughs> so that's why we call them magnets, because they, the city was named Magnesia. Now, <coughs> if you remember when we started our discussions on electricity, we said that, okay, now we had, did I had a balloon? I think I did. And we saw an example of a force. Now today, unfortunately, I forgot to bring some magnets. So let's just make some observations. I pick out, pick one rock from magnesia. And then I pick up another one. And when I bring them together, I observe that they push them apart, push each other apart. So how can you explain this? Let the force be with you. Okay, there's some force. Now, what are the forces that we know? Within these courses. Okay, gravity. Okay, okay so how can we test that this force is not gravity? So, I mean, it will just tell me that they have a weight. No, th this, is, this is the experiment I do. I just take one of them, both of them, and when I hang them up, oh, this is how they stay. This is the experiment I'm doing. This is my observation. Okay, so this is not gravity. And gravity is eliminated. What other force can it be? Electrical force. How can I eliminate that possibility? Hmm? Okay, so I ground it. I connect a wire. So what would what should have happened? Maybe they are insulators. And if they are insulators, the char their charge will not dissipate. In the Okay. They will? So, okay, electricity also exerts a force in vacuum. Okay, so that's another, another experiment that 
we are supposed we have to do. Let's say this is side one, this is side two, this is side three, this is side four. In this configuration, they just push each other apart. And then I make another experiment. But this time I just take I just reverse the orientation. This is side three, this is side four. In that case, that they, they tend to pull each other. Okay, so does this eliminate the possibility that the force is electro electric force? So let's say we have the dipoles. I, I take one dipole, another dipole, I put them side by side, they will push each other. I flip the orientation of one of them, they will pull each other. It can still be electric force. Hmm? I don't know, maybe it's a new kind of an electric force on, on the macroscopic level. Well, I can still create, I can create these dipoles. Maybe a friend of us wanted to play a joke with us and he just took two conductors, charged them with one charge, took an insulator and put these charge conductors in, into the insulator so grounding them wouldn't tell me anything, wouldn't tell me that's not an electrostatic force. In this case, they, will, they can pull or push at the same time just by changing the orientation. So how can we be sure? Okay, then you are saying that I bring another positive charge. And, well, the experiment will tell me that it push, it pulls it all the time. Now, that's my observation. I mean, I have th these two pieces of rocks. I bring some positive charge, and the positive charge is attracted by these things. Okay, so we can divide it into two. Now, if it is a dipole, when you take a dipole, this is positive, this is negative. Let's say if you divide it into two, this will tell you that at the event you will end up having one positive piece and a negative piece. Okay, so then I divided them, what should I do now? Okay, I divide the other one also. I mean, <coughs> just dividing, cutting it this into two, what will it tell me? I mean, what should I do after I cut them? Okay, so you're, you are saying that I can divide these into two then I will have four pieces. I hang them, so what should I observe if it's an electric force? What should I observe, observe if it's something else? Some of them always attract, some of them always repel each other independent of how I orient them. Right? Then I can say that, okay, probably it's new, something new. Other comments? So? What about a quadrupole? Anyway, I mean, just saying that, okay, this is a new force is not that easy. This is the and store. So you make one observation. There are two possibilities. Either it is something new, or maybe it can be explained in terms of what we already know. But it just turns out that this new force, that so-called magnetism, we cannot really, at least until the 18th century, I mean, it had no connection with the electric force. 
only in the 18th century we discovered that, 1800s, we discovered that it has some connection with an electric current. When we made the observation that if you take a compass, for example, when you take the compass, and when you approach a wire uh, carrying a current close to the compass, so let's see, you have, uh, this is your compass, If you bring a current carrying wire close to the compass, the compass will be deflected. Pusula. So basically this experiment tells us two things. One, somehow the current and the magnetism, they are, affected, they are related to each other by some means. Since this is affected by a magnetic field, it tells us that the current is creating a magnetic field, and the magnetic field exerts a force on a magnetic field. On a, a magnet exerts a force on a magnet. Well, that we already know with the experiments, when we just connect, brought to these two magnets close to each other, they just exerted some force. So now we know a different force, a magnet <coughs> created by a magnetic field. Now let's let's start by discussing what is the force exerted by a magnet on a conductor. Now this force will turn out to be have lots of weird properties. Now let's let's start with this one. Let's assume we have a region where we have what's called a magnetic field. Now, if you remember, when we were discussing the electric force, we invented this concept of the electric field, that if you have two charges, charges, each charge creates an electric field around itself, and then when you put another charge in this electric field, it will feel a force. Now, we do the same thing with the magnetic force. Now, we imagine that there is a magnetic, f magnetic field if you take a magnet, it will create a magnetic field around itself, and if you put a current running through this magnetic field, let's say, let's imagine such a circuit. So there is a, well of course, there will be some resistance over here. There will be some current running through it, and there will be a force exerted on the wire. And in this case, at least in this configuration, the force will be in this direction. This is the direction of the force. It is not in the direction of the magnetic field. If you look at, for example, the electric field, the direction of the, f a charge f the, direction of the force that a charge feels in an electric field is in the direction of the electric field, or in the opposite direction. Now, in the case of this magnetic field, uh, we have the define this, we turned out to define this magnetic field such that the, f the force is always perpendicular to the magnetic field. Because we will see that, for example, if you have a charge, now the current is nothing but a collection of sh charges moving in some direction. If you have a single charge, independent of which direction they move, the electric field will always point in the same direction. But in the case of a moving charges, the direction of the force depends on the magnetic field, and it turns out that it depends on the direction of the motion of the charges. So, for example, for such a wire, the force is in this direction. If we would take another wire, in this case, the force will be in this direction. They're in the same magnetic field, but they, they feel different forces. This doesn't uh, happen in the electric field. The direction of the electric field uniquely determines the direction of the force. But in the case of the magnetic field, it just turns out to depend on how the charges are moving. And we can, if you just imagine a very small segment of the wire, this is, let's say, DL, it just turns out that the force that the magnetic field 
exerts on this small piece of wire, well, it is proportional to the current. And it is in this direction, dl cross b. Do you remember the vector product? Shall I, shall we review it? Okay, let's just go over, uh, make a fast review. Okay, if we have two vectors, the vector product is itself a vector. So we have to specify two things, it's magnitude, let's say this is vector A, this is vector B, this is the angle between them. The magnitude is the product of the magnitudes times sine of the angle between them and the direction is given by the right hand rule. So for these vectors A and B, what is the direction of A cross B? Hmm? It's inside the screen or out of the screen? Inside. It's inside the screen. So you just hold your fingers in the direction of the first vector so that your palm points in the direction of the second towards the second vector. In that case, your thumb points in the direction of the uh, vector product. Okay, so this is all you need to know about the vector product. It's a vector whose magnitude is given by this number over here and it, whose direction is given by the right hand rule. Now, now I, I, you don't need, I mean, you see, vectors themselves exist independent of whether you choose a positive direction or a negative direction. So I don't need to choose a positive or a negative sense. If I say that, okay, if I choose this direction to be the positive direction, in that case, A cross B will be in the negative direction. If I choose the positive direction to be in that direction, then the, the A cross B will be in the positive direction. As long as I don't talk about the components, I don't have to choose a coordinate axis. And only if I want to talk about the components of vectors, then I have to choose a coordinate axis. Now these definitions, the nice thing about these definitions is that this definition doesn't depend on the components. So for this definition, I don't need to choose a coordinate axis, I don't need to choose a positive or a negative sense. Okay, so let's apply this one. What is this force? So we have this uniform magnetic field Well, let's do an ex another example. Now let's just imagine that we have a circular loop. There is a resistance, there is a bat, it's connected to a battery. So this part is a circle of radius R. What is the total force acting on this wire. Now we know how much force it acts on a very small part of it. Df will be I dl cross B. Now let's divide this wire into various segments. Not necessarily small. Let's take Okay, these are the straight segments. This is segment one. One, two, and three. The current is running in this direction. What will be the force, 
the direction of the force acting on segment three. Left, right. Left, right, up, down. Let me see some more hands trying to figure out with the right hand rule. So the current is going up. DL, we can just, uh, DL in that expression is the, uh, a vector in the direction of I. So DL is going up. B is inside the screen. DL cross B is towards the left. So all the segments on of segment three will feel a force towards the left. So this is F3. What about the force acting on segment one? Well, the current is going down. The L is in this direction. Magnetic field is towards the screen, so the force is in this direction. This is F1. And F1 plus F3 will be zero. Because they have the same length, they have the same current, they are subject to the same magnetic field. So for each small segment over here, I have a corresponding small segment on the other side, which will feel exactly the same force with the opposite direction. So they will just cancel each other. F1 plus F3 will be exactly zero. So the net force will be only due to this circular segment. Now let's calculate the force due to the circular segment. Let us just imagine a small DL The L should be in the direction of the current. What is the force that this segment feels? The direction of the force that that segment feels? Well, let's see. By the way, I mean, if you have any homeworks to hand it in, I will not accept any more homeworks from now on. OK, the L is in this direction. So my fingers in the direction of the L. Your palm, inside of your palm, should point in the direction of your B. So DL, B, so this is the direction of the force. It is radially outward. So this will be the direction of DF. Now let's just call this angle theta. Now the magnitude of DF What is the magnitude of DF? The magnitude B times sine what sine 90 it is the sine of the angle between these two vectors. Now, DL is in this direction. B is in this direction. The angle between the two is 90 degrees, the sine of 90 degrees. This is the magnitude of the force. Now, any questions up to here? How we determine the direction, how we write down the magnitude? So this is my force, DF. Now I would like to talk about the components of this force.
Well, I, I could have just said that there is a current I running through it without showing the battery. If there is no, if there is a battery, there is no resistance. It's kind of like saying it ha there will be an infinite current running, running through it. So that's why it's it's better if you put the resistance explicitly. Sure, sure. I mean, I mean, you see, whatever we show the resistance over here is they are not necessarily these small cylindrical objects. There, it is anything that has a resistance. For example, your body can be. This can stand for your body, or it can stand for your radio or your cellular phone. This is anything that has a resistance. Now, this is the EF. Now, I will choose my axis. This is my X axis. This is the Y axis. This is the X, this is Y. Here we have the angle theta. Now, in terms of the vectors, and we had already said that df is i times b times dl. What is the df vector? Plus i b dl sine theta in the y hat direction. Now, let's see, I have this part, this is a symmetrical arc. So on the other side, I have another fork, another segment over here, quite symmetrical. It has another DL, and the force, let's say the F prime, they will have the same magnitude. You see here, the F and the F prime, they only differ by the theta, and the df doesn't depend on theta. Whether we are o on this direction or over here or over here, it has the same magnitude as long as I choose the same segment. So this force df and this df prime, they will have the same magnitude. They have the same y component, but their x components, it will just differ by a minus sign. So when I sum them up, the y component will be just zero. The x component will be zero. Now, let, let's continue with this one. That, that's one thing we already know about the answer. The answer should have a, a component only along the y direction. But for the time being, let's just keep both of the components and see whether the y component, the x component will be zero or not. Now here, as I go from one segment to the other segment, theta is changing. So I somehow have to relate dl and theta to each other. Now, how can I relate dl and theta? So you see, this is my circle, semicircle. Here I take, took a length DL. Now this is angle theta. This is D theta, the change in theta. And DL is equal to r times d theta. Just looking at this arc over here. So this is how dl and theta are related. So that tells me that df is equal to i b r d theta times cosine theta in the x direction plus sine theta in the y direction. So what are the limits of theta? <coughs> so theta, I just define it like this. The starting value of theta is zero. It goes up to pi. So the force, this is nothing but the sum of all the forces by due to these very small segments, this will be equal to i b r d theta cosine theta x hat plus sine theta 
y hat as theta goes from 0 to pi. And this will be i, b, r. OK, if you just integrate the integral of cosine theta, minus or plus, plus sine theta, in the x direction, the integral of sine theta is minus cosine theta. Theta goes from 0 to pi. i b times r. OK, when pi is equal to, when theta is equal to pi, this is 0. This is cosine pi is minus 1. Minus 1, minus one is plus 1. y hat minus. When theta is equal to 0, this is again 0. This is this time 1 minus 1 minus y hat twice i b r in the y hat direction. This is our f. So we can calculate the force. OK, any questions up to here? Now, we will study it next week. Now, you see, just like in the electric case, if you have an electric charge, it creates an electric field. But the force that the charge feels is due to the electric field created by other charges. Now, in this example, we will see that this wire creates its another electric, another magnetic field. But the force that each segment here will feel will be due to the magnetic uh, force created by other segments, other sources. Of course, for example, the wire over here will feel a force due to this wire over here. But they will all cancel. This is a magnetic force. Yes, the magnetic force that the current feels. There was a question. Uh, sure. I mean, this is what just a double check in the sense that we already know some properties of the final answer. So we did the calculation and we found that that property is actually satisfied. The x com we, didn't, we expected the x component to be zero because of the symmetry. And now we have seen that the x component is actually zero. So our, I mean, if eventually when we did all this calculation, keeping the x component, if we found an answer that contained the x component, that would tell us that we had done something wrong. So in that sense, it's, it's not always a bad idea to calculate things that you already know the answer of. They will tell you whether you are doing is actually correct or not. We will discuss it in the next hour. I mean, there, there are two things. One is, OK, we have this current. We have said that we, can, we could measure the force felt by a current. But the current is nothing but the uh, point charges moving with some velocity. So somehow, this, uh, the moving charges themselves should be feeling some force due to the magnetic field. So that we will discuss in, a, in the beginning of next hour. Another thing that we will be dis discussing next week will be these moving charges will themselves be creating magnetic field. Okay, see you after the break. You have your second quiz if you want to pick it up. <laughs>